Okay, well, welcome back to our series on the history of idolatry, lesson number two. You might remember lesson number one we were talking about, um, according to the Bible, when did men become idolatrous? When did all this start? Um, in lesson two, this lesson, we're going to answer, we're going to attempt to answer the question, why? Why did men reject their creator, Yahweh, and find it more pleasing and more advantageous to create their own gods and their own way of worshiping those gods? And so uh, I think in, in asking the, that question why, it will help us as we look at idolatry today. Uh, do we have idolatry in the modern sense of the term? And the answer to that is absolutely. And so if we understand why men created their own gods, um, I think it will help us in being able to understand why men worship idols today, though it's different. As we talked about in lesson number one, our idols today are what we call morally neutral our idols today are neither right or wrong in themselves, but it is what you do with those idols. It's, it's what you do with those items, whether it be money or fame or popularity or some type of hobby. And so if we understand why men turn to idols, it may help us to understand and, and be able to uh, teach other people today as well as ourselves. And so we're going to talk about the question of why. So let's review a little bit our premise in this series of lesson. Um, from a biblical standpoint, uh, we have no evidence in the Bible of what we call the visual form of idolatry um, before the flood. Everything we see as far as the worshiping of idols, the objective of that, uh, the objective type of worship comes after the flood. But as we did in lesson number one, when? When did all this happen? Well, we know that Noah uh, understands why the flood came about. We, we understand that he doesn't want that to be repeated. And so, what? He, he worships God, he teaches his children, his grandchildren, generation after generation, about these stories, about the flood, about Adam and Eve, about all these stories in the first six chapters of the Bible. And he wants them to know Yahweh and, and, and to, to serve Yahweh with their lives. But at some point... There comes to be a generation that rejects Yahweh. And it appears to me that Moses is telling us that that point is at the Tower of Babel. And that was really what we talked about in lesson number one. And so in, instead of trying to honor God, they were trying to honor themselves. Instead of making a name for God or calling on the name of God, they were trying to make a name for themselves. And God was not pleased with the type of unity and the type of purpose that they had in that unity. And so, how long did it take from the flood to the Tower of Babel? How long did it take for men to turn away? Well, according to Genesis 10 and, and that information in the genealogies, it appears that it took a hundred years. A hundred years after the flood, men Descendants of Noah begin to turn away from Yahweh. But of course, in the Tower of Babel, what happens? God separates them. God confuses their languages, and so they're divided and they're scattered, and so they're divided into what comes to be nations. And all these nations start to form their own culture, their own religion. As we said in lesson number one, they are all different, but they're all the same. For the most part, these nations reject Yahweh and go into idolatry and uh, polytheism. And so here's the question. Why? Why is it that these people 
find the worship of Yahweh so um, objectionable, uh, objectionable and um, turn to idol. And so from the Tower of Babel, we see idolatry explodes. So what we're dealing with is a study of religion, a study of man and religion. And what is interesting is I first started research on this. Um, I started looking under the subject of the history of idolatry. Well, most of what's written out there is written by people that are uh, experts on history, experts on the history of religion, but they're not necessarily religious or even Christians. Um, and so they don't approach it from that this is idolatry, they approach it as this is all grouped together as religion. And so I had to, to change gears and started to look at books and articles and so forth that studied the history of religion, the history of religion and man. And so one of the interesting things is that um, when you look at the study of religion, the study of religion is broken down into two periods or two categories. And I found this very interesting. So there is the first period of time, which they call the prehistorical period. So what is that? Well, that's basically what they would say. And again, this is not being taken from a biblical standpoint. But this is what they would say is how man invented religion and, and involved himself in religion, what he believed and what he practiced um, before writing was invented, before men had the ability to write. Now, from a biblical perspective, when did that come about? Did Adam and Eve, were they able to write? Um, Noah, was he able to write? Um, I believe probably so. But the interesting thing that the only writing I could find, the first writing I could find in the Bible doesn't come about until the time of Moses. Again, I, I could be wrong about that. I could have missed something. Let me know if I do. But this is a study of religion before writing. And so what's the evidence? What are we looking at? What are we trying to find out uh, about religion? Well, such things like ancient burial sites. Uh, even our burial sites uh, have religious overtones to them. Uh, this is a big one, cave drawings and, and things like that. And so you can imagine a study in prehistorical religion is a little more difficult because there's not going to be as much information. It's not going to be as clear. Uh, for example, in a, in a cave draw, uh, drawing, there's got to be some type of interpretation. You've got to try to figure out what these drawings represent, and you hope you're right about that. The second period is what's called historical. Okay? And this, as you can figure out, is the study of religion when men were able now to write about their beliefs and practices. And so as we look at the historical period, well, it's a much better uh, amount of information. There's more volume, more information. It's better information because it's written down. And so if we know the language, we just interpret it and we, we, we figure it out. Um, and so what I've done in this study, again, we're interested in the biblical perspective, but we're looking at some information that is from a historical standpoint. And I think it still will correlate to what we see in the Bible. So what I've done is I've taken um, both of these, evidence from prehistorical and historical, and asked this question of why. Why did men start creating their own religion in rejection of their creator? And so the answer to that is multifold. There are actually several answers. But one of the very first things that I discovered is that 
Over and over in these um, historical religious books, um, you, you see this the sentiment that in their research, man appears to have always been religious. Okay? And, and so they're marking something, they're seeing something in that that is very interesting that man is not the only creature that occupies the earth, but he is the only creature that is religious. And the evidence is, even prehistorical evidence, is that man has always been religious. Man has always sought to worship something um, above himself, beyond himself. Obviously, as we talked about last uh, time in lesson number one, that can include man worshiping himself as well. But that's more of an elevation of self to a, a, a deity um, than just simply an inward type of worship. And so I want to show you this quote, and I could show you many of these quotes, but this is from R. Merritt in his book, The Threshold of Religion. And he states, a man is incurably religious. Religion is a constant and universal feature of man's mental life. And again, I could, I could show you many experts saying kind of the same thing, that religion has always been part of, of man. And some might say, well, religious is instinctive. It just comes about, okay? Now, let's, let's pause here and think about this. Man has always been religious. It's not the Bible saying that. That's what these historical experts are saying. And he is the only creature on the face of this earth that is religious. You don't see animals... Uh, birds or anything like that being religious. So how would evolution explain that? Evolution has a very difficult time explaining, uh, coming up with a workable idea of why man, as he evolved, all of a sudden became this religious, moral creature. In fact, many evolutionists don't believe that there really is morality, that there is something called morality, that there's really right or wrong other than what you individually believe. And so when you, when you come upon this idea that man has always been religious, it's going back to long ages ago, um, the evolutionary theory has a very difficult time why that is and how that came about. But let's take it from the standpoint of creation or scientifically talking, speaking, um, an intelligent designer. Well, does the Bible give us an answer why men and only man has become religious? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, the Bible explains it very well in this passage, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. And so what did God do? God created man in his own image. And as you look at that, that statement of being created in God's image is only stated about human beings, mankind. It is not stated about any other creature. And I believe that's the answer. What is the likeness to God? It is not a physical likeness. It is not saying that we look like God because the Bible makes it very clear that God doesn't have flesh and bones. God is not like man. He doesn't look like man. He doesn't think like man. He's a spiritual being. And so the likeness is a spiritual likeness. In fact, what we, what we see from this is that man was created with what we might call a dual nature. 
that he was created from the dust of the earth, so he is what? He's physical, he's fleshly. But he was also created in the image of God, and so he's also spiritual. And I believe that's why you see man being religious. We have this spiritual nature. Now, sometimes it's misdirected. Sometimes it's taken away from the direction of God and put it into another direction, which we call idolatry. But the Bible has absolutely no problem explaining this first evidence that man is the only creature that's religious and has been religious forever, ever since there has been man. And so evolution has difficulty, but the Bible does not. So let's go into now the question, if that's true, why is sometimes the religion of man against its creator, against his creator, and towards his own gods? And like I said, what we're going to find is that there, there actually is several answers to this. And I believe that all of them are related to the, the, this question. I believe there's, that men become idolatrous not just for one reason, but for several reasons. And so what I discovered is, and, and it makes sense to me, one of the reasons is because man was lonely. A Gaius Glenn Atkins in his book, The Procession of the Gods, um, states, Our loneliness and the questing longing of humanity, which has from the first felt itself alien to the order about it, have been great stimuli to religion. And so Atkins is saying, well, he's saying, well, especially as you go back to the ancient world, man feels very small. And very much alone. And again, I take you back to the Tower of Babel. What happens? Man is all together and what? They're separated and they're scattered. And, and there's still places you can go today where you're out in the middle of the world. You're out in nature and you're the only one around. And you feel so small and insignificant. You feel so all alone. And you realize that there is so much out there. You take a look at, at space, and, and in the ancient times, so much of that was just unknown. What is space? What is the, the, the stars out there? And so one of the reasons is that man felt very alone in this world. And I would imagine if you reject Yahweh, then, yeah, you're going to feel very lonely. You may have family, you may have some, some people that are part of your community, but still, you're going to see the vastness of everything around you. And that's going to lead you to what? I, I, I need someone, I need something in my life that's going to answer some questions that's going to give me some communication, that's going to give me some feeling that there's something out there beyond just this meager existence. And I believe that's a big part of why man becomes idolatrous. You see, if man felt lonely, what we understand, it wasn't because God left man, it's because man left God. And when you leave God, you definitely have that danger of feeling all alone. I think it's one of the reasons why most people tend to what? Want to be together in the city, in, in the big city, to be around other people. There's a sense that, well, I don't feel all alone. And when I'm confused, I can look at what other people are doing. Well, again, I think that's a big part of it. Even though, it's not, even though they reject God, it's not just a rejection of God and I'll just do my own thing. They create their own gods. And they create their own religion. And I think a lot of it has to do with that. What, what we see here is that one of the reasons is because man is lonely. 
And he knows there's something out there bigger and better than himself. Another reason why men turn to their own gods is because of fear. Because of fear. Because of things man doesn't know or man doesn't understand. Um, let's face it, again, think about in biblical times back in, in, in the book of Genesis, man was stuck in a world filled with unknowns. He was challenged to survive that which he didn't understand. I mean, think about this. Even today, men are um, thinking that death is mysterious. Great fear of death. There's a great unknown about it. Um, illness, food supply, storms, and just the vastness of the sky or, or, or the vastness of space are just a few things that motivated man to seek help beyond this world. And so I think the first point, the loneliness, along with the fear and, and, and not knowing all these things, I think this has a big, they come together to form this need. I need someone to protect me. I, I need something beyond me to give me some answers to let me know what's going on here. Why is there this earthquake and, 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 and it's destroyed all these things? This hurricane or this flood and why has my family member died? And what happened to them? Man all alone doesn't have all the answers. And especially if man rejects Yahweh. He won't have those answers. Again, when you look at the Bible, you see evidence of this. You see evidence of what? Men going to fortune tellers, soothsayers, false prophets, and, and the like. And God condemns every single one of them. Well, why do these fortune tellers come? The soothsayers. Well, because men want to know the answers to some things. Men want to know why this is going to happen or why that's going to happen or why did it happen. And they've rejected Yahweh. They don't like God's answers. And so these are their ways of finding out the answers to their questions. Now, are they truthful answers? I don't believe so. Just like fortune tellers today, it's a trick. And it works on people who really, really think that there's power in it. Who really have a fear of this or that and want some guidance, but they don't want God's guidance. And each time, God says, you do not go to the fortune teller. You don't go to the soothsayer. Why? Because I'm the God that truly knows the answers. I'm the God that truly knows the future. And I can tell you the future, and I will tell you the future, but I'll tell you just what you need to know. And I can imagine some men don't like that. Some men don't like that God won't answer all their questions or reveal everything to them that they want to know. And so Yahweh is rejected and they go find their own answers their own, by their own gods. In fact, as you look at the history of religion, you, you find these mystery cults that a lot of these mystery cults are what? Well, let's take a look at what Atkins says again. He says, fear and helplessness and perplexity have been shaping forces in religion, though not the only forces. So again, what's Atkins saying? He's saying fear, helplessness, perplexity of the world around man is definitely been a motivation, a shaping force of man becoming religious. 
So these fears became the driving force for many of these cults, these mystery cults. Cults were formed to help man deal with these realms of secrecy and develop rituals to survive. And so a lot of these mystery cults surround what? Death. And give answers to death and how you can conquer death and how you can have the ease of mind of death and, 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 and mystery cults that deal with illness and sickness and, and natural disasters. And so I think this is a very big factor, especially if you don't have God on your side, if you rejected Yahweh, you're going to turn to idolatry because of your fears. Because what you don't understand, you don't have power, and the things you don't know, you don't have the answers. But there's another answer that I found that I think makes a lot of sense, and that you see in the Bible as well, and that is what's called animism. Um, some experts refer to it as fetishism. I'm going to use the word animism. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but what is it? Well, this is the belief that objects and forces are actually spirits or gods. So, in other words, trees aren't just trees. They're spirits. The wind isn't just the wind. It's a god. I know a lot of you are probably thinking of Pocahontas right now, and that's a good analogy. The moon, the stars, and many other things are seen as being not just forces in the world or objects, but seen as being divine spirits. And so you can imagine, you've rejected Yahweh, and you see these forces in the world. You see even objects having great strength and power sometimes in what they can do. And so what man starts to do is he starts to worship these. They don't have control over them. They don't have control of the wind. It's something beyond them. They can't understand the stars or the moon or the sun. And so they start creating them as deities, and they start worshiping them. Some of them actually worship the sun. Some of them attribute some sun god and the like. But either way, it's still this animism. Animism facilitated an explanation of natural phenomena and storms and other natural disasters. This is another answer to the mysteries and the fears of the world man lived in. Now, of course, with God, God answers those, and God protects, and God provides. God heals. God delivers. But when you reject Yahweh, it's not just, hey, I don't want Yahweh. They turn to idols. They turn to worshiping the stars and the moon and the sun. Because of these fears, because of these mysteries, because of this feeling that I am not in control. So is there any evidence of the, in the Bible of this? And the answer to that is absolutely. For example, in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah 7 verse 18, God speaking through Jeremiah says, The children gather wood. And the fathers kindle the fire. And the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out libations to other gods in order to spite me. So I want you to notice what, what God is describing through Jeremiah. He's describing a worship service that God's own people are involved in. They're going to offer up sacrifice. They're going to offer up libations. But it's not to Yahweh. It's to what? The queen of heaven. And God sees this as being done to spite him. As a rejection of him. Uh, take a look, if you would, <clears throat> at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and in verse 19. 
In Deuteronomy 4, verse 19, as Moses warns the second generation to be prepared to do what their parents refused to do, he says to them, and beware, lest, lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and see the stars and all the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Look at what he warns them about. When you go in the land of Canaan, be very careful. You don't go and you look at the stars and the moon and all the heavenly hosts and, and bow down and start worshiping them. That they become your gods. Now, why would Moses warn them about that very activity? It's because that's exactly what's going on in the world at that time. That's the way the idolaters, the pagan nations, the Canaanites, one of the reasons they're being driven out is they don't worship God. They're involved in animism. Let's take a look at another passage that shows this in the Bible. Job 31, <clears throat> 26 through 28. Job says, If I have looked at the sun when it is shown, <clears throat> or the moon going in splendor, Right? Think about some of the, the, the great scenes you see about the moon and, and, and how beautiful it is, or some of the sunsets that you've seen. Job says, if I looked at that when, when it's in its splendor, and my heart became secretly enticed. Remember what we said, what is idolatry? Notice what Job says. My heart's involved in it. My heart is enticed in it. If my hand threw a kiss from my mouth to what? The, the, the moon, the stars, the, the sun. That too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment. For I would have denied God above. Why, why would Job talk about this? Well, you say, well, he's, he's trying to show his, his dedication to God. Absolutely. But he's comparing it to what? those in his own day, in Job's own day. Animism is alive and well. And Job is saying, I'm not like the others. I don't throw a kiss to the gods of the heavens. And so you can see this animism is um, alive and well in the Bible. You see it throughout. And then there's a fourth reason that men turn to idols and reject Yahweh. And it's called hedonism. What is hedonism? You probably know this, but this is the religion of not just pleasure, but extreme pleasure. And that's the thing about pleasure that often happens, the worship of pleasure. It's not just, hey, I want to have a good time. It's what? I want to have a great time. And then once you have a great time, I want to have a magnificent time. And it keeps elevating and elevating. And this God keeps getting bigger and bigger and draws you in deeper and deeper. And so one of the reasons that men seek out idolatry is because they want to worship pleasure. Hedonists believe the meaning of life is to pursue those things that give the most pleasure. And so I say, no doubt, this was a religion practiced before the flood as well as after it. And so when you think about hedonism, no doubt, when you talk about the, the, the seeking of pleasure, you see that before the flood. You see that as one of the reasons that the flood came, that God said, I, I'm disappointed that I made man. You see it after the flood as well. And here's the thing. You talk about why men reject Yahweh today and create their own God and find their own way to worship that God. One of the biggest things today in our U.S. culture is hedonism. It's pleasure. Let, let's face it. There's a lot of people who skip church because they got something more fun to do. 
they, they, they don't have time to go to church this week because what? They're out having a good time, taking a trip, whatever it be. There's a lot of times where the, the seeking of pleasure, extreme pleasure, takes the place of a dedication and the worship of Yahweh. And so I believe this is one of the big, big reasons. But there's, there's a, a little something here. Here's the, here's the trap. There's a lot of people who believe that they're worshiping God, their creator, Yahweh, but they've changed God. They're actually worshiping pleasure. They actually are worshiping God their own way. They've actually turned God into an idol and they don't even realize it. And hedonism is one of the biggest reasons why men fall to that trap. What about the Bible? Well, there's a story in the Exodus about this very thing. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 and 2. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughter's of Moab. So the daughters of Moab, what? They invite Israel, hey, why don't you come to our church service? Why don't you come join us as we worship our gods? And the Israelites say, great, let's do it. So look at, if you would, at verse 2. For they invited the people to sacrifice to the sacrifices of their gods, plural, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods, and verse 6, Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Do you understand what's happening here? Most of Israel has gone off to play the harlot, to, to be involved in idolatry to sacrifice to those guys, to eat, drink, and be merry. And all of a sudden, the, the leadership, the, the dedicated ones, they're at the tabernacle. And they're weeping and they're praying to God because they, they're, they're, they're saddened by what's happened, this compromise. And all of a sudden, this Israelite shows up with a Midianite woman. The Midianites and the Moabites were, were combined. They, they were together at this time. And he takes her into his tent. He is not ashamed of what he's about to do. He's excited. And remember what happens? God sends out a plague. And, and these Israelites are getting killed one after another because they're playing the harlot. They, they're turning to hedonism in the name of religion. And Phineas. One of the dedicated sons of the high priest, or, or, or one of the, yeah, one of the sons of the high priest, goes in, and this is a terrible story. He kills both the Israelite and the Midianite woman, and God stops the plague. God checks the plague because of his reverence. Because he didn't com compromise his ways, but wept and brought an end to the immorality, the hedonism that was going on there. And so as we talk about why, well, I want to I bring out some more reasons, which I think, again, are really reflected in the Bible, really are relevant today. Um, serving God, our Creator, obviously is the best choice, isn't it? But a lot of men reject Yahweh, even though they might think, hey, I'm still worshiping God and following Jesus, they've rejected Him because they've changed Him. He's not a God of wrath anymore. He's just a God of love. He's not a God that, that gets angry anymore. He's just a God that just forgives everyone. And that's, that's an incomplete picture of God. That's an erroneous picture of God. And so many reject Yahweh because... Even though he's the best choice to worship Yahweh. 
In fact, I say on several occasions that God has not called to live on a high standard. God has called Christians to live on the highest of standards. It is a difficult life because He expects us to be like Jesus Christ. And, and though we will never be perfect at that, he, he continues to request that we excel and, and try to do that. And, and some men say, no, thank you. Even today. Uh, number two, let's face it, in the Bible, whether you're talking about Old Testament or New Testament, God is restrictive. God says, that sexual relations is only for marriage between a husband and wife. Well, there's a lot of people say, forget that. That's too restrictive. Um, God says in, in His Word that marriage is between a man and a woman, and, and a lot of people say, no, that's too restrictive. You, you take a look at um, Adam, and what did God say about Adam? God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him what? A helper. A companion. Singular. But then you see Lamech, a descendant of Cain. A descendant of Adam through Cain. And what? He says, that's too restrictive. I'm going to have two wives. He's our first polygamist in the Bible. He says, no, thank you, God. I'm going to have two wives. And even in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, God reiterates what? It is one man for one woman. Just think about the creation of temple prostitution. Having relations in the name of religion with someone you're not married to. Why, why, did, my, why did that happen? What, how and why did men create that? Because God is too restrictive. And that has always been this idea of rejecting God because God makes you a slave and, and when you reject God, you become free. Well, the New Testament addresses that, right? You think you're free, but you're a slave. And men just don't get it. And so I think a big reason is, number one, to worship and serve God, it is not easy. Because He's very restrictive. He's very demanding. But I want us to understand, He's offering us the best place, not on this earth. Beyond this world, He's offering us heaven to dwell with Him forever. And we have to be prepared for that. Number three, I believe a lot of people, a lot of men rejected God because he cannot be seen. And, and you go back to the story of the golden calf, Exodus 32, verse 4, and what? Uh, Israel gives up on Moses. They give up on God. They say to Aaron, you make us a God, right? We want a God that we can see. And so Aaron makes them the golden calf just like they saw in Egypt. And what do they do? They um, start worshiping the golden calf. They eat, drink, and they're, they're at play. Much like the story later on of the Moabites and the Midianites and the idolatry that went on there. It's hard to serve a God Be dedicated to God whose only voice you can hear is through His written Word. Uh, I, I understand how hard it is. And because of that, men rather worship something that's more physical, more visible. And I want you to think about that in Christianity. It's, it's the same way in Christianity. Men have made God visible and physical. Uh, statues and altars and icons and the such. Though we still say it's all for God. It's all for Yahweh. And I think another reason why men rejected Yahweh and created their own gods 
was because the worship of God never was and never will be a party. That's not the same uh, as idolatry. In idolatry, it's all about having a good time, or at least a lot of it. Being free, doing what you please, eating, drinking, and being merry. That's not the way it was for God. Now, that's not to say that the worship of God is, is just this, some terrible thing, but it is not a party like the hedonism that's out in the world today. Exodus 32, verse 18 and 19, going back to the golden calf, Moses is coming down and he, he's hearing the people, the sound as they worship the golden calf. And he said, it is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat. They're not being attacked. This is the sound of singing I hear. And it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned against them. They were having a good time. It was a big old party. And Moses was upset. And I, I, I really think that if we're honest today, you, you see the end of the day where we are turning from a very inward, solemn, heartfelt, emotional worship. Some think of that as more a old-fashioned, traditional type of worship. To what? A much more entertainment-oriented worship in churches today. Much more exciting and fun and oriented in, in, in entertainment. You know, in that old form of worship, Christians, when, when they were excited about something, when they agreed with something, the, the expression was, Amen. But in our entertainment-oriented worship, no doubt, what do you do when you're being entertained and you like something and you prove of something? You clap. You applaud. And that's what we're seeing in churches today. And so, why have men turned away from God and created their own gods? Close our lesson. Here's the problem. You've got these people rejecting Yahweh, the one true God, the God that knows the, uh, the future, who has all the power for an idol. And I say, here's the problem. Man-made gods might have been more fun. They still might be more fun today, but what? They couldn't talk. Idols couldn't talk. Because <laughs> they weren't real beings. They were a statue made in the image of man and made with man's hands. And, and, and the way that they got these gods to talk is they'd bring people to the, the, the temple, the front of the temple of that god, and, and that person would be given a chance to express or request something of that god, and there would be a priest inside who would then speak as if that god was speaking. And the people believed that that God had spoken to them. That the man had to give voice to the God. They couldn't talk. They couldn't deliver. They couldn't fight. And that's the thing that's amazing in the Bible is over and over they get defeated. They get defeated. Where is their God? They never, they're never troubled by that. Yahweh overpowers them. And they never ask the question, where is my God? They can't do their own fighting. It reminds me of the story of Gideon, where Gideon was commanded by God to destroy the idolatry of, uh, of Israel, and he started with his father's idol, the idol of Baal and the Asherah, and he tore them down. And the people woke up and they saw this and they went to Gideon's father and they said, you've got to do something about this. Your, your son has done a terrible crime. 
And remember what Gideon's father says? He says, if Baal is a real God, let Baal contend for himself. Why do I need to do something? Why can't Baal do it? And people came to the, having to, to do stuff for their gods. They had to fight. They had to speak for them because these gods wouldn't do it. They could not contend for themselves. And that wasn't a problem for the people. They couldn't know the future. And yet, that didn't stop people to say, what are we doing here? Even to the point where they would sacrifice their own children to a man-made God. Yahweh is the one that can speak, and He speaks through His Word. Yahweh can deliver. Yahweh can fight. Yahweh does know the future. And it might be more difficult. Not easy. It may not be a party. There might be some restrictions there. But it's all for our good. God knows what He's doing. And we just need to bow the knee to Him. And when you do that, all the excitement, all the joy, all the thrill will come to life for you. Not in a physical way, but made in the image of God in a spiritual way. Thank you so much for joining us in this series. Uh, we, we hope you join us for lesson three. In lesson number three, we're going to be talking about where did these gods come from? How did these men come up with the idea of these gods? And that will be lesson number three. Here's our information. Love to hear from you. Uh, our website there. All of our lessons can be found on that website. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you could go to our YouTube page and just simply type in Brea Church of Christ. Click on the videos. You'll see all of our lessons there. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you lesson number three.